Hello, everyone. My name is Justin Pritchard, uh, and I'm going to be walking you through the next several modules uh, where we talk about accommodating English language learners at OCC. And so I'm thrilled to have this opportunity and to describe a little bit about uh, how our support has shifted and how we've shift, how we uh, also maybe need to rethink how we support language learners in the classroom and in academic support settings. Um, and so just to kind of frame this, uh, this is an introductory video and uh, it's going to lead into several modules that you're going to complete um, with all with the goal of becoming a bit better versed in the kinds of supports that language learners um, can benefit from. And so as always, if you have any questions about any of this, about the um, content or about the rationale, uh, or the design or, or navigating uh, throughout any of this, please feel free to stop by my office. Um, I'm in Gordon uh, 202A. Uh, many of you know uh, where that is, but um, it's certainly easy to find in the Learning Center uh, if you don't. And so today, the goal is going to be really just giving an overview of how academic support relating to English language learners has shifted at OCC and frame some of the content and frame some of our terms. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and we can get started. Uh, and really just by way of, of organization, um, I wanna give a quick introduction to why this work is so necessary. I want to talk a little bit about the challenge of L1 proficiency, and, and we'll talk about what L1 means uh, and what proficiency means as we move through. Uh, we want to talk about accommodating ELLs and assessments and the benefits of those accommodations, um, and also talk about some research on the fairness and validity of providing accommodations to English language learners. Um, and so just to frame our work, according to the most recent census data, Nearly one in five households in uh, the region that OCC describes as its reach, right, our kind of tri-county uh, area, uh, speaks a language other than English at home. So one in five of the students that we're targeting have uh, are multilingual and have proficiency in some other language. To think about the, the scope of this, Syracuse City School District at our doorstep here, right down the hill, um, describes that there are, or indicates that there are over 70 languages, 70 different languages spoken within their borders. Um, and for most of these learners, most of these individuals, one of the key issues in helping to support them is supporting processing time and time on task. And we're going to talk about some ways that we do that. Um, but really to get from true beginner, and we'll talk about what true beginner means, L1, um, excuse me, uh, A A1, to get to L1 proficiency, which means similar to your first language, takes between six and eight years. And that time span really depends on uh, whether you've learned another language in the past, how much English exposure you've had, how long you've been in the country, um, or, or how long you've been exposed to English, I should say. Uh, and, and of course, this is a long time. If we told students that we, they needed to wait until they achieved full first language proficiency in English, um, that, that's a long time to wait to earn a degree or an additional degree, as many of these students that we all know have degrees uh, in the country that they're from. Uh, it's a long time to wait for a thrivable wage. It's a long time to put your dreams on hold. And so we don't have an overarching policy on accommodating student language needs outside of what's just been passed uh, to help students in academic um, testing scenarios. So some key terms that I'm going to be using uh, both today in, in this presentation and throughout this training. When I talk about L1, I'm talking about first language. Right, so your L1, my L1 is English. Um, if you grew up speaking English, it's the first language that you learned. Your L2 is the second language that you learned in L3 and, and so on. But it makes it easier because English often isn't a student's second language, which, you know, if you look down here, ES, oops, I can't highlight, 
ESL indicates that English is the second language, which is sometimes the case, but not always the case. So it's just more accurate to talk about English being their L2 or spe more specifically their target language. Right, so the, it's the language that you're learning. It's the language that you hope to acquire. Um, and we frame all of this through a scale called the Common European Frame of Reference or KEFR for short, or KEFR. Um, this is an international standard. It allows us to talk about language using common metrics. And if you uh, look at the, the graphic that's to the right of the slide here, A1 and A2 are considered basic, right? A1 is emerging proficiency. A2 is situational proficiency. So if you think about A2, you can go to the grocery store, you can go to the doctors, you know, you can navigate uh, some situations. But you're not communicating nuance of meaning. When you shift over to B1, B1 really allows you to indicate preference and opinion. B1 is the first level. And think about paragraph level proficiency um, or building paragraph level proficiency. B2 is being able to describe in detailed terms your ideas and your goals and your aspirations and your perspectives. Um, it allows you to synthesize multiple ideas and, and talk about how those ideas intersect. Um, so B2 is really where we're aiming when we're talking about academic proficiency. You need to be able to do that in order to in order to enter the academic arena. C1 and C2 are considered proficient. C2 sounds proficient. C1 is proficient and uses a uh, maybe a different version of English or a different variety of English, which we'll talk about in module one. Uh, C2 sounds like an L1 speaker. Um, Although I, I want to make sure C2 um, almost always still has some accented English. There, there are very few individuals who learn a language past the age of 11 who can mimic L1, uh, L1 accent. Right? And so I think it's important to, um, to draw that parallel. Um, <clears throat> some other terms, ELL is an English language learner, ENL is English as a new language. Um, and I think it's important to say none of these are offensive. None of these. So some people say, I don't know if I'm using the right term. It's not that, you know, it's the right term or the wrong term. You know, it might be that they're in English as a second language speaker, but it might be that they're in English as a third or a fourth or a seventh language. Um, so in, we just know that English is new and we know that they're learning. And so most places, uh, prefer ELL or ENL just because it's more accurate. Um, but ESL isn't isn't a slight to people. It just uh, isn't always accurate. Um, another way, English is an additional EAL. English is an additional language is another. Um, and ELI is English Language Institute, of course. Um, it's challenging reaching that C2 Keffer level proficiency. Um, and in the past, we've done that with a credit bearing model. And without getting into all of the intricacies of this model, the problem with this is that it was expensive and it started the student's credit clock ticking and it took a long time. Each of these is a 14 week semester. We have one semester, two semesters, here's one academic year. Here's a second academic year. Here's a third academic year. So if you start off as a, uh, a1 true beginner in this class and it'll take you three academic years before you exit ESL 116 and begin taking credit bearing coursework. Now this isn't to say that this model was bad or ineffective. As a matter of fact, um, in many ways this model was great because it allowed enough time on task to be successful. But very few of the people who started here in ESL 087 at the very beginning ultimately made it to graduation. And so our new model, our community-based organization, uh, or excuse me, our, our ELI model, takes where they leave from a community-based organization, so the basic language that they get through Northside Learning Center or Bob School or uh, wherever, and it gives them a pathway to credit-bearing coursework that's, that's much more abbreviated. Uh, and that can be more can be tailored to what their needs are. 
and it exists outside of credit bearing space so that it doesn't start the credit clock ticking and they don't incur any um, cost. This is all free. So they take LI1, which is uh, basic English, right? Think about A1, A2 proficiency. LI2 is uh, tries to move students from B1 to B2 proficiency. And once they meet that B2 proficiency, they shift over and this uh, ESL 116-103 or English for Medical Professions uh, gives them the specific language that they need to uh, function in that high B2, low C1 proficiency, ideally. But because this is so much shorter, we really have to ground all of the rest of our work in academic support. And that's where we come in. Um, this is what the trajectory could look like. And if you look at, um, you can move from A1 proficiency to B2 proficiency if you've never had any language learning experience in around two years. If you've taken English as a foreign language in another country, or if you have some English exposure or have taken learned another language previously, you can move from A1 to B2 proficiency in as short as six months. And so it's really important that in these spaces, the LI1 and LI2, sometimes students will loop here. They'll stay in LI1 for a couple of rounds, a couple of seven week rounds. They'll stay in LI2 for a couple of seven week rounds, and then they exit to uh, the, next, the next level. But you can get here in about two years, even if you've had no exposure. Right, and so, um, then you can work on your proficiency while you're earning credit. Um, and typically, students spend about two cycles in each of these. Um, they usually spend two cycles. They spend an entire semester in uh, LI2, is what I've seen, uh, and then move into 116, uh, 103. There's a lot of ways that we can accommodate and we're going to talk about this throughout the module so i'm going to go really quickly here but one of the ways that we can do this is to eliminate anxiety in the classroom by cultivating multicultural and linguistic awareness among the people that are helping students learn and so the more we know about the language acquisition process and what can help students be successful the better poised we are to offer them the support and um, offer them the emotional support that they need to build proficiency in the language um, this is in classroom teaching, this is in academic support settings, right? This means offering additional time and other uh, assessment modifications that don't take away from the construct measure. So if it touches the learning outcomes of a course, of uh, the objectives of a course, we shouldn't be doing it. But if we're giving students the time and the space and the time on task necessary to build their proficiency through these assessments, then we're doing the right thing. Some ways that we can do this in, in uh, the classroom or in tutoring sessions. Um, I know many of you function in both spaces. Um, are to provide you know, glossaries for, uh, for high use words that are in your class that aren't content related, right? So you teach those content related terms, um, but on assessments, you, know, you, you uh, remove the content related terms and give them just a basic English dictionary. You give them a customized dictionary or glossary, um, or you just provide some extra time or you simplify the language. All of these things give students the opportunity <clears throat> to, um, to practice the language and to build confidence in the content. Because what we're really doing in all of these spaces is asking, is asking them to do two things simultaneously. And so this is a very brief um, overview of the kind of work that we're going to be doing. I hope you found this uh, useful and interesting, and I look forward to seeing you in the first module. If you have any questions, as always, uh, my extension on campus here is 6093. If you're off campus, that's 498-6093. Um, and my email address is right here. I look forward to hearing from you and uh, working in the discussion boards in our first module.